2024 P100 Training, Chapter 6, Electrical Engineering. Your presenters today are Jeff Seatrum, my colleague in Central Office, and myself, Ben Pasarczyk. We're both electrical SMEs in Central Office. The electrical training today is divided into three sections, a very short general section, a lighting section, and a power section. So I'm going to talk about general requirements, and I want to point out that the way we've set this, these slides up is if it's an update, that means it's an actual change in P100. If it says reminder, then it's something that could have been in P100 for many years, but that we're just wanting to point out because it often comes up. So P100 compliance and waivers. P100 is mandatory. P100 waivers are considered for unique project-specific circumstances. P100 waivers are for pre-installed deviations. They are not granted after the fact. We encourage project teams that if there's something that is in violation of P100, that that project team seek compensation from the contractor as opposed to a waiver. P100 waivers are not granted to save cost or for value engineering. Jeff and I encourage those that may have a potential waiver request to reach out to us prior to routing that waiver for signatures. That signature process in the regions can be rather lengthy. And the last thing we want to do is have a minor change or something when it uh, makes it to our desk. So if you can reach out to us and we can help you kind of craft that language and also let you know whether or not there's a good chance it would be approved, um, that'd be great if you can do that. And many of you do, and we, we appreciate that. Jeff and I also maintain a running log for future P100 considerations. Feel free to contact us at any time and whatever you bring up, uh, we can add to that log and then three years down the road when we update P100 or for an addendum in a shorter duration, we will review those. We also keep that running log for past uh, decisions that were things that we did not incorporate in P100 so that we don't continually rehash the same thing. Before I turn it over to Jeff for the lighting requirements, are there any questions on what I've said so far? All right, Jeff. All right, uh, before we jump in here, just for those of you that may be here primarily for EVSC, we will be covering that uh, after we go through the lighting and power sections. We're gonna have an EVSC section after that. So that, that is coming up, so don't, don't worry, we'll get there. All right, so on to lighting here. As we go through today, we're gonna to have some updates. We're tracking, we're, we're talking about items that have changed with this edition of P100, obviously. And then we'll have other sections we're gonna to refer to as reminders. Uh, these items haven't necessarily changed, but comp rarely enough, we're gonna take advantage of the fact we have a larger audience than we usually do today. We wanna to go over those and make sure we're all aware of them. All right, so moving on. So one of the first things we have to talk about here is this, this first slide. It shows the target lighting levels that we're supposed to be meeting uh, for our typical spaces that we deal with on a regular basis on most of our projects. So every project involving lighting should be using these, this, these levels as the baseline through design and then verifying that they've actually been met after installation. Uh, for spaces not shown on this list, we, we follow the IES library. Uh, for those of you, those of you may have heard of it, the IES handbook, it's, it's the same thing, it's just new, the new name is the IES library. Uh, the good news is that the IES library is included in a, under our MADCAD code and standards uh, reference description. So we all have access to it should you be working in a lab or some other odd type space we don't deal with on a regular basis. But this table here just shows you the, the typical foot candle levels that we're trying to meet at all the spaces. So on to some updates. Uh, P100 requires that all new interior and exterior lighting must utilize solid state high efficiency luminaires, think LEDs when you get that. Uh, that meet the requirements of Design Lights Consortium version 5.1 or DLC Luna version 1.0. Great, what's that mean? So let's let's do a little translating to English here. So, so first off, for anyone not in the know, DLC or Design Lights Consortium, they're an independent nonprofit organization that certifies lighting fixtures and controls, make sure that they actually meet key, key criteria related to lighting quality and energy levels. Uh, the first item we have here on, the, on this list here is that uh, we're updating from SSL version 5.0 to version 5.1 for interior fixtures. That includes retrofits. So version 5.0 was delisted in 2022 uh, and version 5.1 took over obviously after that. So uh, version 5.1 uh, includes new color quality uh, requirements that will help provide good color rendering uh, with better color consistency over time. That means that as items fail and get replaced over time, it'll be more difficult to distinguish from the old and the new. And it also improves upon glare, glare performance. So new in this P100 is the addition of DLC Luna version 1.0. That deals with exterior lighting. So in addition to the 
the, the, the lighting quality parameters. This is also looking at limiting light pollution, sky glow, and light trespass. If you've ever worked at some of the border stations, whatever, so we have bright lighting, lighting outside, outside. Light trespass is always a problem. Uh, this is going to help us to help ensure that we we get those the, the light trespass requirements under lead, and that we're not having problems and, and bothering our neighbors and stuff like that. So this is this is the third party thing that's verifying that we're actually going to get what we want. So there are literally hundreds of thousands of items listed under these DLC criteria. So there's really no excuse not to comply with the requirement. Where the fixture is covered, which brings up our, our last point on this slide here. DLC ratings don't cover all lighting categories. So one that we hit upon a lot are decorative fixtures. In those instances, the project's lighting designer must evaluate on a case-by-case -case basis to ensure that the lighting quality and efficiency levels are being met in accordance with the 100 requirements. All right, so uh, lighting controls had a handful of updates. First off, before we get too far here, we do not require controls involve individually addressable luminaires or fixtures. However, we do recognize that such controls may have a beneficial role on some projects. So we're including discussion on DALI 2 and D4I. So DALI, that stands for Digital Addressable Lighting Interface. It's a communication protocol across the lighting control system. Some of you out there, you probably worked on some previous DALI projects, maybe under ARA. You probably have a few horror stories that we don't want you to share here today. But DALI 2 addresses the problems that we ran into with the previous version of DALI. So it addresses the proprietary control problems. It lets us deal with systems where the manufacturer may no longer exist. There's a way out. You know, they, they probably should have called it something other than DALI as a marketing strategy, but DALI 2 is what they called it. DALI 2 it is. D4I is shorthand for DALI for the Internet of Things, DALI for IoT. It's an extension of the DALI 2 protocol that enables LED, LED luminaires to interact with the control devices, such as sensors in the external control network. Typical example of that is where we have a sensor on the, on the lighting fixture itself. It controls both the lighting and the HVAC for that space. So the next couple of slides deals with power over Ethernet systems. So this is a totally new topic for the P100. So if you're, if you're not familiar with POE systems, they kind of take the, the lighting system of old and turn it into an IT system. The power and the controls for the fixtures are all run over Ethernet cables back to IT switches. When we do use POE, we've included several key items to, to help the system last longer and ease in the future maintenance of it. So cable jacket colors is one of, is one of those items. So for, for Cat5 Echo and, and 6 cabling running all over the place, we wanted to ensure that POE systems can be quickly distinguished between the cabling for your, your communications data drops for your computers and whatnot throughout the office. The easiest way to do this is simply to use separate colors, separate jacketing colors. Beyond that, the emergency lighting will also be through separate IT switches and the other normal lighting for the space. And we can segregate out, out those fees by using red jacketing just to let us know what, what's the emergency lighting versus the, the normal lighting. So the number one item that's going to degrade your POE system over time is heat. Okay, so we specifically call out that cable bundles cannot exceed 24 cables. This is going to reduce your heat gain amongst that group of cables. It's going to increase the system longevity. So we also have the system to not exceed the power output for both the switch and the actual port used for, to power the luminaires. That's something to watch out for on the designs as you could inadvertently exceed the switch limits. So the cable length, that's pretty standard for Ethernet cable, the 328 feet there. Uh, there. There are several different standards up for PoE. We specifically call out the I, IEEE 802 Class 8 90 watt standard. That's a higher wattage standard, allows for more luminaires to be powered from, the, from, from a single port, higher efficiency levels. So then to close this out, we have luminaires should be provided with dedicated drivers and, of course, the LAN switches or IT equipment. So next up, we have uh, an important reminder we wanted to throw out there on, on retrofitting of, of existing fixtures to LED. So first off, the final fixture shall maintain the UL rating. Retrofit kits must be DLC standard. We talked about DLC a couple of slides back. The drivers shall be dimmable. You know, we've all seen retrofits where the outcome is brighter than we thought it was going to be. This help guides us against that. Uh, a low light flicker risk. So flicker, if you don't know, that's, that's, that's just like what it sounds like. The, the light uh, output kind of strobes, oftentimes faster than your eye can pick up. But your eye does, does sense it, and it, it can cause eye strain and, and headaches, migraines, and whatnot. So, we, you know, that's one of the things we want to try to avoid there. That was, that was a really big problem in the, in the, when LEDs first came out. Not so much now, but it's, it's, it's getting better. Uh, the, the photometrics and glare control must meet IES guidelines for the task being performed. 
Uh, here's one that admittedly a few of us may have missed. A mock-up is required for typical building areas to ensure lighting quality output and control are appropriate. This means doing a couple of key areas first, checking them out before you move on to the next spaces or moving down further down the hallway, whatever the case may be. You know, you want to do that test first, that test scenario first. Make sure it's what you think it's going to be. Uh, and finally, retrofits must be reviewed and approved by the regional subject matter expert. So here's a shameless plug for my electrical brethren out there. You know, we may be busy, but please give us the chance to review the proposal of designs. You know, it's much easier and cheaper to, to, to fix a problem before it gets installed. All right, well, we're talking about retrofits. There are three basic types of retrofits, types A, B, and C. Type A is where you're basically replace, replacing the bulb. Uh, the existing fixture remains intact. You reuse the ballast. This is the cheapest method for installation. It's gonna generally save you energy. The drawbacks are that it doesn't save as much energy as the other methods, and you're reusing the ballast, which is gonna become more difficult to replace in the out years. Then we have type B. So these, these bypass the existing ballast and are direct wired to the mains. That means if you're not paying attention, the simple act of replacing the bulb in a live fixture exposes you to voltage levels. So new in the 24 P P100, we no longer allow type B retrofits in our buildings. Then finally, we have type C. So these are gonna save you the most energy, they're gonna eliminate the ballast, but they also cost more. So type C is the preferred method because we all know that at some point down the road, we're eventually gonna have to rework those type A's as the ballast lines get discontinued. And then one last thing for lighting, uh, it has to do with supporting the fixtures and, the, and drop ceilings. So we're now requiring that at least two supports on a diagonal axis back to the building structure. Uh, in many states, this is a requirement for seismic or firefighter safety. It's generally a default in our project specs as it is, but we know it's not always universally happening on all our projects. So we've added to the P100 to help make sure that it does happen as we roll forward. So that kind of closes out our, our lighting section here. So we're gonna kind of do a little pause and see if there's any questions on lighting before we go on to power. Yeah, we do have one question for, for from Mark in the uh, Q and A. He says, "Does the project AE have to change the standard electrical specification to require red cabling for emergency lighting?" And I would say yes. Um, and typically, what we've seen is that the the non-emergency lighting would be maybe a yellow cabling, and then your com cabling is typically blue. I'm sure we've all seen in the field. Yeah, and that, that's specifically for power power over Ethernet. So yeah. Another question, has there been a notification or communication with the Building Technology Services Division, IT, to coordinate IP addressable lighting control, scanning, and re remediation? Yes, there. that's a great question, and there would be if it was specified on a project. We definitely have them get in, uh, involved. And if I'm not mistaken, one of those previous bullets uh, mentioned about IT owning the switches, if I'm not mistaken. Yeah, yes, yeah, so that, that is in the yeah. P100 as such, that, that way too, yeah. yeah. All right, with that, I'm going to pass things over to Ben. I'm going to start in the power requirements. Yep. If, if there are any other questions, just throw them in the, in the uh, Q&A there, and we'll get to them. We have one more. Go ahead, oh, Rob. You raised your hand. Ro Robert Clark, you have a raised hand? You're on mute, Robert. He's on mute, yeah. I think he was just stretching. Okay, we'll, we can come back to you later. All right, Ben, you're up. All right, power requirements. Getting right into it. All right, so we have some photos here um, and some uh, terminologies I want to go over because this comes up quite often. So for secondary distribution, we have, all right, Robert, I see you there. Do we want to answer your question before I move on? You're on mute. Robert? Okay, maybe type your question if you can. Um, so switch gear on the far left, switch boards in the center and your typical panel board on the right hand side. This is in section 6562. We've included the section numbers on the slide. So if you're reviewing this at a later date, you can go back and maybe more thoroughly read the section. So a few uh, versions ago, we started um, using the UL listing to differentiate between switch gear and switch board because so many folks, including electrical engineers, use those interchangeably. 
and there are they are two different pieces of equipment. So talking about switch gear, this is a rep good representative photo. These breakers, these cubicles can be racked out and removed, replaced. Um, typically switch gear it has a longer longer longevity. Obviously, we know many of uh, GSA's buildings are in our portfolio for many, many years. It's more resilient, uh, can be refurbished, and we have a lot of those projects going on currently that are being refurbished. However, it is more expensive and it is larger, and that's the pushback we get on it sometimes. So when you're laying out your electric room, you need to ensure that you have switch gear and the proper amount of cubicles um, laid out. And depending on how many breaker sections you're going to have, the size of your switch gear, it's going to drive the size of your room. So that's very important to have early on. Moving over to switchboards, UL891. They are uh, less expensive. They're typically smaller. They're less reliable. Um, the less, when I say reliable, they're, you're not able to rack breakers out, rack new breakers in, get things back online, that, that type of situation. You basically have to kill the entire board to do maintenance and those sorts of things. So there's, So the availability of that particular facility would be less typically in a switchboard situation, I think is a good way to say that. Um, they cannot be refurbished, they're typically replaced. So that can be an issue if you need to you know, replace the entire gear as opposed to refurbish it. Um, and then your typical panel board, UL67, we typically use those up to 400 amps. More commonly, um, 225 amps are very typical throughout our buildings and I just wanted to include that there uh, for reference. So what did we change in this section? Same section, the switch gear must meet UL 1558 and be provided for the service entrance equipment of any service. Uh, we had previously building of 1200 amps or greater, so 1200 amps is the key, key uh, number there, um, but we had different scenarios that uh, folks said, well, it's not a building, so I don't have to do it. So we, we changed it to a service. So the main service to any facility or whatever it may be uh, must be draw out switch gear if it's 1200 amps or greater. All switch gear and switch switchboard panels need to have hinged covers in lieu of removable covers for safety purposes. One of the folks on our committee uh, told us about a situation where a cover had gotten dropped down into the gear, causing a fall condition. I think fortunately no one was hurt, uh, but it could have been very uh, serious. And not only dropping it into the gear, you know, just removing it, setting it to the side, it could get bent, damaged, lost, whatever it may be. So having those as hinged and remaining on the equipment is a change to P100. So these are all reminders on ampacity and capacity requirements. Comes up quite often, so I wanna go through this, take my time, uh, feel free to ask any questions. Um, so for panel boards, for branch circuit panel boards, we have a 50% spare ampacity requirement and a 35% spare capacity requirement. What does that mean? So the ampacity is the load on the panel itself. You could have a panel board that was completely full of circuit breakers, but they were all lightly loaded and there would be ampacity on that panel board. Or you could have a panel board that was completely maxed out from the load perspective and still have spaces or spares in that panel board. So that, that's the difference between the two and we need both. Otherwise we can't tap into those at a future date to, you know, to feed for a renovation or something like that. So lighting panel boards are sort of along the same lines there except it's 25 percent spare capacity a little less probably doing a lot less to a lighting panel over the years of its life versus say a receptacle panel um, both the lighting and the receptacle panels must be fully populated with spare circuit breakers when we review drawings we don't want to see any spaces on our panel schedules and the reason why is because when that switch gear package is brought, bought out with hundreds of panels probably included these breakers are pennies on the dollar at that point when they're buying those packages out versus us having to come back in 10 years or five years and try to go buy, you know, 50 circuit breakers or 20 circuit breakers. And in many cases, they may not even make them any longer. Therefore, you can't even get them. So it's important to fill those panel boards up uh, for a new construction. So switchboards and switch gear are a little bit different. So the capacity ampacities and capacities are a little less because they're larger pieces of equipment. So for the switchboards, one spare circuit breaker. Uh, one spare per each size circuit breaker. So typically a switchboard is going to be feeding mechanical equipment or some larger uh, that uses a, you know, a 60 amp, 80 amp breaker, 40 amp, what may be. So we're not, you know, filling those full of a, of a smaller breaker like we would be in the panel boards, but we're going to look at what that, that switchboard is feeding and make a educated decision on what to fill those up with of similar breaker sizes. And that's why we have ORs directed by GSA, because there could be situations where 
putting certain size breakers in does not make sense, and we're certainly open to that. You can discuss that with the designer. Switch gear, 25 and 25 for both, and one per each frame size fully equipped. So again, a lot of times this gets mistranslated. There's such a thing as a, a prepared space, which is not a spare circuit breaker, and I've had people try to sell that as a, as a spare circuit breaker, and it certainly isn't. Um, we want to have frame size breakers that we can use to replace breakers that are currently in that gear. Um, so that's important to have. Hey, ben, yes. Oh, there was a question from mm -hmm. Tiffany Mitchell. Uh, mm -hmm. I believe the slideshow, the presentation is in slideshow mode. Um, if mm -hmm. you need to enlarge it, there's a little um, magnifying glass in the lower right hand corner of your screen that you can enlarge. So, thank, thank you, Ben. You. Yeah, thank you. So, while I've paused here, Robert, do you have a question? Robert Clark? Hand still up. Right. I think Bob is. I think Rob is shaking his head. No, I think he's all set. But but Rob, okay. if, you, if you on the lower part there, where your there's a the icon with your hand there. If you, if you click that again, it'll go from red to, to black. So that'll take your hand down. So we stop bother, stop bothering you. Okay, I, I closed it as well. All right, thank you. All right, so we did have um, one change in the spare capacity requirements, and this question has came up often, um, and it's a great question. And if someone's doing a small renovation, let's say they're putting in a couple of outlets in a pantry for a microwave, and when they add those circuits to the panel board that, that's existing there, they're eating into that spare capacity that we just discussed. You know, they don't have that amount of spare remaining, and they say, you know, what do we do? Do we, do we have to put in another panel board or something like that? And the answer is no. That's what the spare capacity and capacity is there for, is to feed small renovations like that. Because we know, again, our buildings are inventory for many years and things like that are going to come up. So what we added to hope bring clarity to this in P100 was in, in quotes here, new components of the electric system. So for projects adding circuits to an existing panel, this is why the requirement exists, as I just explained. If the project is adding a new panel board or a switchboard, then yes, you would need to size it accordingly so that you had that spare capacity. So hopefully that makes sense and we'll, we'll clear that up moving into the future. Electric rooms. So we've had several items here. Uh, these bullets have been in P100 for many years, some of them for many years, some of them for the last few versions, but I'm going to go through each one and hopefully it's apparent why they're, why they're all important. This is 6572 if you want to go there and read the entire section. But the electric rooms are required to be stacked in core areas. So hopefully that's understandable. They're a hub. They're going to span out with circuits and, and feed a, a designated area. Um, they have to be accessible by two perimeter walls. What else do we find in core areas? We find elevator shafts, mechanical shafts, things like that. And if the, that electric room is completely surrounded by shafts or other walls that you can't penetrate with conduit to feed those loads, then it's not helpful. So they have to have two walls to penetrate. Minimum size six by 10, that's a good rule of thumb. Obviously they can be larger, but that's the minimum size of an electric room. They serve no more than 10,000 square feet. Again, it's a very good rule of thumb. Uh, if it's a perfect square, obviously it's 100 feet. We start uh, exceeding 100 feet in one direction. We start getting into voltage drop problems and things like that. Uh, we do say branch circuits 120 feet or less. This goes along with what I just said there. Um, we start having to increase conductor sizes and things like that. We do work with people on that. If you have a if you have a floor plate that's 11,000 square feet, we're probably not going to force you to put in another electric room. We may have you add a panel or a small closet, or depending on the you know the type of facility is you know nothing that you needed. We may just do a, a waiver for that for a paper trail. Um, and then last here, 30% spare wall space. So I shared this uh, drawing. Um, it's an actual building of ours. And uh, you can see that there's not 30% spare wall space in that, in that room. And there's no doubt in my mind when that building's turned over that there, there will be more equipment in that room than what's even shown in this drawing. And so trying to fit a new panel board or something in there in the future just isn't likely. So we have that 30% spare wall space. And I made that comment on that particular review. So minor updates, and, and I, would, I just want to say it, it's probably obvious by now, but we didn't have a lot of major updates to Chapter 6 P100 this year. A lot of it was clarifying language, 
trying to make things easier to read and easier to understand. There aren't, you know, a whole lot of major changes in P100 Chapter 6 electrical. So for this, this is the um, 65434. Uh, this is um, under direct berry conduit. And, you know, we had noticed in there that we talked about schedule 80 PVC for direct berry conduit. And then we, then we also called it a duct bank. So it's not a duct bank because those are typically concrete in case. So we, we cleaned up some of that wording. We had some folks point that out to us. Likewise, a second bullet, uh, 30 inches thick backfill above a concrete and case duct bank. Some interpreted that as we wanted 30 inches of concrete above a concrete and case duct bank, which is certainly not what we wanted. So we changed the word thick to deep. Hopefully that'll be uh, make more sense. And we increased the manhole opening requirements from 30 inches to 36. I think that came in from industry as a suggestion. Elevators, a couple of updates here. Uh, the first one there, ensure that critical control circuits and elevator pits are positioned, otherwise protected from water intrusion to ensure operability during OEE or fire service use. So obviously we wanna keep those functioning. That is a new ad. And 6583, elevator controllers must have an SCCR rating that exceeds the calculated fault current. This is a code requirement. We don't like to repeat code requirements, but we do like to draw attention to them where we think that there may be um, issues that may be getting overlooked and that sort of thing. So that's why we included that. So our understanding that the S, that uh, elevator controllers, SCCR ratings, there's not a lot of higher rated controllers out there and we wanna make sure that we get what we need for code. And then the last bullet, chunk trip breaker uh, or fused, or current limiting fuse disconnect must be provided for sprinkler systems. In the past, it only said chunk trip breaker and we, we've included current limiting fuse disconnect for that. Okay, moving on with uh, general updates. So we had a section in P100 that talked about conduit and its usage, and uh, there was some confusion there about, for an example, that all feeders had to be ran in IMC and things like that. So we kind of cleaned that up and just harmonized with the code and anything that is above and beyond code we, we listed there, such as compression fittings for EMT. The electric vehicle supply equipment um, was moved to chapter eight, which we're gonna talk about a little bit later. Um, we added the approval of electric of the electric utility, and this is under the PV section. It's very important, especially if you're trying to or planning the back feed. Type two SPDs increased from 250 KA to 300 KA. That's the maximum standard size. And I think um, the next size now would be 260. So we moved it on up to the maximum standard size. Codes and standards under this section were relocated to the appendix. So we had a list of codes and standards in chapter six that are also uh, listed further back in the appendix. And in order to save some space and just sort of consolidate, we, we harmonized with chapter six, make sure everything was back there. Um, so if you go there looking for where you used to look for these codes, um, you know, don't be upset, just go back to the um, appendix and you'll find exactly the same thing, anything new that was added. Sections were reformatted beginning with 654. So I think it was up in the site requirements. We felt um, that we needed to add a section number, which obviously bumps everything all the way down through the through the chapter. Um, so if you have section numbers uh, memorized, they may have changed. I think they should only be off by two, though. The severe weather uh, photovoltaic specifications are in 65161. Just wanted to bring that. Uh, to your awareness. I think those were put together based on lessons learned down in Puerto Rico with the past hurricanes that we had. And then we have controlled receptacles. Again, that's just a reminder um, in accordance with ASHRAE 90.1. So the controlled receptacles are required. However, they're not required to be green any longer. We changed that on uh, the last iteration of, of P100. Um, so but they do have to be marked in accordance with ASHRAE. Generators. Um, this is a change here. Fuel source um, for diesel is recommended for 500 kW and larger. That previously said 350 kW. And again, it's recommended, not mandated. The elevation of the, um, of the generator and other critical electrical gear, I think I might have skipped over that previously, is now consolidated in Chapter 4. So if you were used to going to Chapter 6 to see the floodplain requirements for a generator, switch gear, and those sorts of things, that's now been consolidated under chapter four. 
low bank sizing. Uh, we have 20% for gas and 75% um, for diesel. We just wanted to be consistent with an FPA 110, and we also wanted to provide some load for a gas uh, unit. Separations of life safety required standby and optional standby. This comes up quite often. Um, we do have to have three separate transfer systems um, separating those loads, give, giving priority to those loads. Typically, it's ten, it is 10 seconds for life safety and then typically 60 seconds uh, for the other two. And, and again, gives the priority to the most important loads. Fuel storage is 48 hours instead of 72. We did not change that this time. That was last go around. I just want to uh, bring it up as a reminder that 2021 with 22, 2022 addendum made that change. And then uh, the 1558 uh, we talked about earlier was switch gear, the emergency switch gear, that's applicable to that as well. So if it exceeds 1200 amps, you're going to need to have draw out switch gear for the emergency as well. Arc flash, uh, the final studies must be completed by the contractor. We have to do that because all the equipment has to be selected. It can't be done early on. The model must be provided to the region in a coordinated format, along with the source code and all rights at no additional cost. Well, GSA uses SKM. We receive those models. We're able to open, open them up. We don't typically do the studies ourselves, but we often open them up and and look to see how they were done, if they were done correctly. And, and then we can also pass that along to a new contractor that uh, may be doing an update to the system, which is very important as opposed to having that new contractor have to go back and recreate the model, which is extremely costly and time consuming. Updates to existing power system models must be incorporated in any modifying project. So if you're, if you're touching the electrical distribution system and you have an arc flash study that's been done recently, please include uh, funding in, the, in there to have that updated. It's a requirement of NFPA. Uh, where no model exists, if 25% of the distribution is being affected, then a model must be generated. So again, funding must be there to generate that model for that particular uh, upgrade. MC cable. Very hot topic, common topic that comes up. I have not listed everything from P100 here. I would encourage you to go to that section number if you're not familiar with it and, and read through it, but no more than three current carrying conductors, number 10 maximum, labeled every three feet, secured in accordance with the NEC. We, don't, we do not use it in high finished spaces or embedded in concrete. And we also don't use it in wet, damp, or hazardous spaces or feeding critical equipment. And the most important there at the end, it cannot terminate directly to a panel board as you see in these photos. Um, conduit must terminate to the panel board and run out to the first wiring device. So that keeps your electric room nice and orderly. And then once you hit that first wiring device, whether it be a light receptacle or whatever it may be, then you can daisy chain with, uh, assuming the, the, it's acceptable for the space that it's in, you can use MC cable from there. Questions on power. All right, before we go to questions, and, and, and Lance just submitted one, but before we go to questions, so Ben was just talking about MC cable. And, and I don't care what building I go into, I can find something wrong with any any installation with the MC cable installation with it the way they did it. This is a common occurrence that they're not meeting what we require in the P100. You know, a few, a few cycles back, we, we made it a little bit easier on the, on the MC cable. Uh, but they, the, the contractors maybe push that envelope a little bit too far oftentimes. And, and we want to make sure that people are following that the MC, the MC cable requirements that we have in the Q100. So make sure that's in the specs, make sure that's make sure we're covered there, and make sure that the contractors doing the installation are actually following up on that. That's, that's where the, the, the weakest link tends to be. So just to throw it out there. So, so Lance threw out a question is, can you clarify the fuel usage for generators, their intended use and electrification requirements? It's like a multi-part question here. I don't know who the Lance guy is, but he's making us busy, so. Um, yes, so the fuel usage previously in P100 was for 72 hours. Um, many of our facilities do not remain up and operational continuously, uh, which is where a 72 hour fuel requirement would be required. Um, so we, we have a lot of detailed information in this section in P100. I won't try to recite it from memory right now, but we have reduced that requirement to 48 hours. And we've also uh, put some emphasis on how that fuel is calculated with respect to the fire pump. I think we would all agree that um, a fire pump's gonna 
is a large load and going to use a lot of fuel from the generator, but that it's not going to run for 48 hours. Um, so I think we calculated it at 24 hours, which is probably not realistic either. Um, so that, that kind of pulls that uh, fuel storage requirement down. Also, there's issues with fuel polishing. So if you store a lot of fuel, that might sound great, but you've got to take care of that fuel. Otherwise, it's not going to be any good, diesel fuel. So that was another reason for uh, backing that requirement off. And, it, you know, we talked to several agencies and uh, regions, and that meets everyone's needs. Go ahead, Lance. It's well, but I'd forgotten about that part, Ben. So thank you for bringing that up. Um, my question was really about the the what the generator is being used for and its ability to use fossil fuels in the first place. So it's a uh, per the electrification section, um, a, a only a um, an emergency generator may use fossil fuel. You are and correct. You and clarify that a little bit more for them. Yes, yes, and that's what we're talking about. We're talking about an emergency generator in this situation, feeding life safety loads and required standby. We're not talking about peak shaving and those sorts of things, which I think is where you were going with that. Okay, all right, thanks Lance, good question. Any other questions? Okay, Jeff, you wanna take us into EVSC? All right. I think this EVSC section may have a few questions coming with it. So uh, don't hold back, folks. We're a little bit ahead of schedule. So if you got questions, uh, even if it's on the previous sections, they have to throw in the Q&A, we'll come, we'll come back to them or whatever. So so EVSC, so you're ro rolling into this uh, electric vehicle supply or EVSC, a lot easier to say, uh, electric vehicle supply equipment. Uh, I'm going to refer to it as EVSC throughout the previous presentation here. Uh, so let's just dive right in. So, so this section has several moving parts. Uh, so we're going to have several presenters. Uh, myself and Ben will start off with the electrical portions. Mike Fagel will speak to the accessibility requirements. And then Dave Faber will speak to the life safety requirements associated with EVSC. So first off, every, first question you're probably asking is, why was this moved to Section 8.5? It's lived for a while in, in Chapter 6. Why is it Why is it moving here? Well, as I mentioned before, there are multiple disciplines involved here. And rather than have you jumping around between the different sections, maybe missing something along the way, it was decided to co-load everything together into one common area, and Chapter 8 fills this role for us. So major changes this cycle beyond the relocation, obviously, include the incorporation of the interim guidance packages for both accessibility and fire protection. Uh, we've increased the minimum ratio of GOVs to charging ports. It used to be roughly three vehicles to one to one charging port. Now it's two to one. And finally, we did some general updates from lessons learned. We've got a few of these projects under our belts. We've learned a little bit more. We've incorporated that into, the, into this uh, latest edition. So we're basically going to go through this entire section 8.5 beginning to end. Uh, there were enough changes this cycle. We felt this, this more comprehensive method was warranted. Uh, the first item when you open 8.5, the first item you're going to see uh, comes up in, into a, a, what projects need to include EVSC and what might that effort include. Well, EV, EV charges must be installed for any project that is significantly modifying or installing parking lots or garages. And that includes resurfacing efforts. As we'll see shortly for POVs, we only need to install infrastructure, but for GOVs at the end of the project, there will be fully operational chargers in place and ready for use. So the next step, we have this location order of preference listed out. We don't always have options available to us, but when they do exist, outdoor surface lots will be our first choice. Then roof levels of parking structure, that means open to the sky. And finally, any other parking locations. As we work our way down this preference order, the installations get more involved, more complex, that equates to being more expensive. All right, the next thing you're going to come across in, in this section is this table, which if you're used to the P100, then you're used to these tables. The baseline level, that represents the minimum that needs to be done with each tier level going just a little bit further. So EVSC, EVSC needs are based upon how the vehicles are actually driven. You know, we shouldn't be trying to do this one-size-fits-all scenario. Our tenants have very different needs. They use the vehicles in very different ways. Uh, so this means that some buildings they're going to have different, uh, uh, going to have a combination of these tier levels as we deal with different tenants throughout the building. All right, that probably sounds more complicated than it really has to be. So let's take a close look at the table here. All right. Hopefully that will make a little bit more sense to you there. So, so for charger quantities, we see that the baseline or the minimum number, the, the baseline is, is one charging port for every two GOVs. 
Tier one takes us to a one-to-one -one ratio, one port to one vehicle. And tier two takes us to anything greater than a one-to-one -one ratio. Places where we may have a high number of, of guest GOVs that come in, they need to fill up before they go back to the return trip. So next up, we have the charger types. So the baseline level here is, is what's gonna be our workhorse model, a level two charger of 6.6 .6 kW. The higher the kW value, the faster the vehicle can, recha can recharge. But given the high dwell times of a typical GOV, 6.6 .6 kW is gonna be more than sufficient. At tier one, we still have level two charging, but slightly higher kW values. Then at tier two, we have level three, or what's commonly referred to as DC fast chargers, uh, where we would typically see things in the range of 60 kW. It's important to note that as the kW values go up, so does the demand in the electrical infrastructure, which at a given facility may or may not be able to fully support. Larger installations or higher kW values may well lead to significant electrical upgrades or new utility fees coming into that site. So, so moving on here, uh, we have EV charging. The very first thing we do is define the difference between a charger and a charging port. We do this because we've seen multiple times where people come in, they start talking about, I need five chargers, I need six chargers, whatever. They're really talking about charging ports, not chargers. So the, the charger itself, that's the device you see in the, in the parking lot or parking garage. That's the, the whole physical uh, thing you see sitting there. The, the charging port, that's basically the cord hanging off the side of the charger. So a single charger may contain one or more charging ports. Now that we've defined things, we move on to this whole laundry list of general requirements. Some of these are going to be pretty, pretty more evident. Or, 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 uh, Richard, you got a question? Yeah. How the okay? You're talking. To, somebody asked a question here about a six six K. So how do you know which vehicles? Because I'm uh, I, I'm very, very curious about these uh, just electrical vehicles. How do you know which car is, is DC? AC is that identified in the car, or is that on the electrical charger itself? And what adapters do you need in order to charge? I mean, for a common person to, because I've never driven one, so I'm not for sure how to charge those. So, are there instructions there? Do you guys right, want to so, lay so, out? Yep, yep. So, so basically, all all the vehicles. Uh, I'm probably gonna get the number wrong. J1772, I think, is is the common North American charging port. Uh, that is slowly transferring over to the NACS charging port. Uh, right now, if you see something out there right now, it's going to be the J1772. It's going to become the NACS, which is kind of like what you see the Tesla type type scenario. They, they, they are different. Uh, the, the charging cords are going to have to change around to, to associate with that in the future uh, as, as, the, as the bottles change out in, in the future. Uh, th basically, the, the car talks to the charger as, as, they're, as, you're, as you're charging up there. And it will it will control it'll throttle back like it, you, you're, if your charger is capable of 60 kW but your vehicle is not acceptable accepting 60 kW, your car will throttle that back down to a level that it can accept. So that's all communications that it does amongst itself, and it's it's kind of like self-contained. So so it is universal then. For the it's it's the the charging plugs the the plug scenario the actual thing that you plug into your vehicle. Yeah, those right. are different. They they are standardizing on NACS. They're not there yet. But in five years out, there'll probably be more universal NACS. Okay. So, so right now there are a few different versions out there. Okay, okay. So so you'd have to order, say you're running. If, if you if you if you if you have a car that is NACS and you come to a to a to a charging core that's J1772, there are adapters that make those up. So you, you can still use that charger, just you have to use that adapter to get across it. Okay. Do you have the NACS is the J3400, right? I, I'm not sure of the number, but I think that might be correct. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, it is. <laughs> All right. Thank you. Yeah. yeah. Uh, Priya, you got a question? All right. I think that was retracted. We do We do have a question, Jeff. And it, it says, oh, oh go ahead. Go ahead. Go ahead. Sorry, I put my hand down before I started speaking. Um, I did have a question initially when you were talking about the prioritization of the location for these units. Um, you said it was based on cost. And I wondered what maybe that factor, that differential was between um, an indoor garage versus in placing in an in exterior space, service garage or service space. Yeah, most of that's, and we're gonna get to that a little bit later on here, but but a little, little teaser, teaser things to come. Most of that's going to come down to your fire protection stuff. It's, it's okay. going to be the safety safety things we want to we want to add into the, into those. Okay, thank you. Yeah. 
and, and I do see a question here. So is the six point, it, this one wrote down the Q&A here, is the 6.6 .6 kW figure for a station or the port? Some models offer charging sharing at 3.3 kW per port from 6 kW at the station. So basically what the question is that the, the some, some stations, I can flip a dip switch or, or, or put a relay across something and it will split a single feed of 6.6 .6 kW across the two ports at 3.3. Uh, so the requirement we have is for the charger, but it, again, we go back to the, every vehicle is used differently. You need to evaluate how the vehicles are used. Uh, we're we're going to discuss that, that, that power sharing where you can go you know, split, split one feed to two different ports. We'll go into that a little bit later on here. Uh, but it depends on how the vehicles are used as to what you need to install at your site. So again, again, it's how the tenants use the vehicles. That's going to dictate what we can get away with uh, as far as our, our energy conservation and stuff like that, trying to trying to save our, 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 our dollars for our installations for our electrical upgrades or whatever we have to do. So we'll, we'll I get think in general, more. I think in general that we would want that sharing capability so that we could plug the maximum amount of cars in unless there was some specific requirement otherwise. Yeah, yeah, and and we, I think we do call out the the, cap the capability has to be there. Whether we activate that capability or not is a different story. So we, we kind of by default want that capability to exist. All right, so on to our on to our. Or were there any other questions before I jump into the general requirements here? Yeah, just is is the system itself grounded? Whatever at the at the electrical station itself is it? How is it grounded? I'm I'm not for sure. Um, well, the, the, the electrical ground goes back through the entire system. To the entire system itself. Yeah. There's no extra extra um, ground you need it while you're charging as, as, it. As far as you as the user there, yeah, yeah. you know, you're, 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 there's, there's ground fault uh, and a lot of stuff built into the system. So, yeah. Okay. Yeah. All right. All right. All right. On to our, on to our list of general requirements. So, so some of these are, are pretty self-evident, you would think. Uh, we won't spend much time on those. Others are, are maybe more abstract. We'll spend a little more time going into detail on what those may be there. So, so top to bottom, first up, comply with NEC. Probably not something you think we should have to spend any time on, but we know that there are people out there plugging their vehicle into maintenance receptacles. That does not meet code. So they can't plug, they can't come in and plug the car into the receptacle on the wall. It doesn't meet code. Uh, then the next several here we have are our, 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 our UL listing requirements here. So EV charging stations must meet UL 2202. EVSE must meet UL 2594. If we have V2G capabilities, that's vehicle to grid or vehicle to building, uh, that's basically we put things in reverse. Have the vehicle batteries help power up the grid or the building. That has to meet UL 1741. Then at number five, we have uh, wireless transfer. That's where you park your vehicle over energized pad. The vehicle is fed electromagnetically instead of actually, instead of actually plugging in a cord. That has to meet UL 2750. So why do we have all these ULs in here? Quite simply, there were a couple of locations that were trying to install some devices that weren't certified to meet these minimum safety requirements. So we spelled them all out for you. Coming in at number six, we have battery energy storage systems or BESS for short. So these battery systems, they could be powered from renewable sources or we could power them up uh, from the utility during off peak hours at night and then draw that power down off that battery to recharge the vehicles during grid peak timeframes. All right, so chargers must be located as close as possible to the panel that's feeding them. Point blank, assigned, char assigned parking spaces are gonna have to regularly get reassigned each time we add more chargers to a building. We should not be bringing a new charger out to an existing tenant parking space unless it just so happens that they miraculously happen to be located near the power source. It, again, that comes down to mostly cost. Smaller conduit, smaller diameter cable, and less of each. Uh, number eight. All chargers should be installed per manufacturer's recommendations. Again, something that seems pretty self-evident and shouldn't have to dwell too much on, but just be aware that there may be internal dip switch settings, maybe some jumpers in there. We need to make sure that all that's gone through during activation. Uh, if, if, we, if we stay with the default settings, we may not be getting what we thought we were getting. Number nine on lateral forces. So these devices see continuous stress and strains. People just simply remove the charging cord for charging. This scales with that. Uh, number 10 is a safety interlock to shut down the charge if the, if the car reports a fault. Like I mentioned before, during the charging cycle, the charger and the vehicles are, are constant electronic communication back and forth during the charging cycle. Uh, number 11 is a sim similar safety interlock. For, for all these safety items we just covered here, you know, make your life easy. We're supposed to be ordering charges off the blanket purchase agreement, the BPA. 
keep with that, and you're going to be good to go on these items. Okay, where items on the BEPA may not meet something, we're actively working with the representatives to get things there. Not going to call anyone out, but there there was one item on on the BPA that didn't meet the UL listing. So so Dave Frable, to you know, he, he jumped in there and said, "Hey, hold up, what's going on here?" So we stopped ordering that thing for GSA facilities. We worked with the manufacturer. They're getting the UL listing, and they're and they're pursuing that now. They're on track to get there later this year. And then once they get that, we're likely going to see a pretty big flood of those those uptick in lava coming in to us here. So number 12, uh, this is a big one. We should only be using network capable chargers and those must be fed ramp authorized. So the network capabilities allows, allows us to track usage and control charging. Both items that we have to do on the, uh, in the fed ramp part deals with cybersecurity. So let me just branch off here on the controls here. That's something we probably haven't had to dealt, we haven't had to deal with too much of that in the past, but as we install more charges, that's gonna become more important. So first off, we have limited impasse before we have to perform significant electrical upgrades. We may need to limit when the vehicles charge. We may have to limit how many can actually charge at once or what PW levels we can actually allow them to charge at. And then next up, we need to limit our exposure to peak demand chargers. So if you're not familiar with peak demand, that's a line item on our electric bills that, that is based upon the highest period of usage, usually 50 minute intervals over the billing period. So if we're not careful with how we allow vehicles to charge, we, we will definitely, no doubt in my mind, we will end up paying more for that peak demand item than we actually pay for the, for the actual power used. So if we get sloppy with the controls, our monthly bills are gonna be a lot more than they need to be. So lucky number 13, this deals with open charge point protocol compliance. So this has nothing to do with charge point the, the company, but rather it's an open language protocol which allows different vendor equipment to talk to one another. Ultimately, this means that we're not going to inadvertently get, get backed into a corner and, and get stuck with the most, most expensive operational solution out there in the future. So we want to make sure we have that OCPP compliance. Uh, number 14, whenever a charger is located in enclosed parking structures, we want to make sure we use fittings and methods rated for damp areas. So the cars coming in, they may be wet if it's raining out. If it's snowing or icy, you know, that's going to come in with the cars. And puddles get splashed around. This helps us account for that. Uh, number 15, it's kind of fire protection here. So, so wall and ceiling mounted chargers are to be installed on non-combustible surfaces. Number 16, in that, in that same vein, exterior chargers need to have a 10-foot clearance about them with no vegetation or other flammable items. Uh, number 17, and we shouldn't be seeing many of these, but any receptacles need to be GFCI protected. Uh, number 18 deals with charging cords. So these tend to be the most abused items on a charger. And we also don't want people tripping over the cords when they're not in use or whatever. So many chargers have an automatic retraction system, kind of like you see at the, the conventional gas station there where the, char the, the cord kind of goes back to the pump when you're done with it. So uh, that's often referred to as cable management. It's an option of many of these chargers here. Uh, in my mind, it's worth the extra money now, and it's going to help you reduce the cost later on with having to replace that cable as this cars going over or whatever it may be. Uh, it may not be universally appropriate, but in most of our, most of our locations, I think it's going to be something that we should we should go for. Uh, number 19 deals with physically protecting the chargers from other vehicles. So I'm sure everyone here listening to me today, I'm sure we're all the great drivers, okay? But we've all seen how that other guy drives, you know, and we need to protect our investment from that. Uh, number 20 deals with lighting. So these chargers are gonna be, gonna be in locations uh, that, that may not have been lit up too well in the past. We wanna make sure that people are comfortable, they feel safe when they're doing this, and they can actually see what they're doing when they're, when they're doing their recharging. 21 deals with ventilation. Uh, not something we normally have to deal with, but as we move into some of these more advanced charging systems, this could come into play. 22 deals with metering. This is a headache, but we have to deal with it. So first off, we need to get reimbursed for electrical usage. And then secondly, we want to make sure that, that the vehicle charging, that we can offset that from the building's electrical usage. We don't want the added electrical load of the, the vehicle charging to prevent our buildings from meeting their energy reduction goals. 23. Uh, each charger gets a label showing what panel and circuit is feeding it. This just makes things a lot easier for future maintenance or troubleshooting. We have similar language in there in Chapter 6 for all electrical devices in general, but since EVSC was shifted out to Chapter 8, we repeat it here just so it doesn't get lost. Number 24, that was a long list, but we're finally near the end here. So this, this deals with the building's electrical system. So if we have a building that is scoping an electrical distribution upgrade, we want to ensure that that 
future EVSE needs are included in, 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 our, in our numbers for that. You know, it's going to be pretty embarrassing if we install a new switchgear tomorrow and then realize that we haven't included the amperage to support loads that we know are coming. You know, like it or not, these are coming. That may not may not be next year, maybe the year after that, maybe two years down the road. These are coming, so we want to make sure we account for that. So at that point, uh, Ben's going to take over for some more specific uh, uh, requirements here, but we, we'll we'll open this up and do a little pause here for for some additional questions if we have them. Now we do have one question on funding, from Catherine, that I think has Waldo answered it. Yeah. Okay. Great. Yeah, we, we have uh, Office of Administrative Services funding and we are doing projects since FY22 to support our own GSA fleets. For tenant support, um, EBSC projects and an agency should come to the region or to our CBI with a RWA to fund the, the, the portion of the project that will that is uh, tenant improvement, TI we will take care, we are supposed to take care of the shell items in those projects, but we'll have a separate discussion on that. And also we are managing the IRA $25 million investment, 30, 33 projects currently ongoing with the regional project teams. Um, and if you have any other questions, we have a, uh, a bi-weekly um, touch base meeting with regional POCs, uh, EBSC POCs. We also have a community of practice um, every other week so so anything anything that you have please share the email share with your regional teams and we we are here to help and support thank you yeah. i see the question came in on accessibility we have that that's coming up in a couple more slides yeah. here we have several slides on accessibility might be talking to us about that yeah. okay getting into 852 government-owned vehicle requirements we do differentiate between government-owned vehicles and povs we're going to go through that so for government owned vehicles, we require complete and operational charging ports. Hopefully that's self-explanatory, but that is the charger and everything goes that goes along with it in order to be able to charge your vehicle. Quantity and configuration of chargers and ports must be designed to accommodate the tenant vehicle types and usage. These next couple of bullets speak to this as well, but it is super important that you understand your tenant's needs, whether it's one tenant, could have multiple tenants in the same building, the way that they charge, the way they use their vehicles, the type of vehicles, uh, if they're emergency vehicles and they always have to have a charge or be on a, a fast charger, or if they're you know used to the day and they can charge overnight, which is the most economical way to do it, you have to understand how they're going to use it. Power sharing allows multiple charging ports. Okay, I'll pause for John's question. What about the courts? The judges have their own parking spot and they start getting having their own electrical vehicle. Are judges going to have their own charging port installed in there for their vehicle parking spots? I'm assuming that judge's vehicle will be a personal vehicle. Their personal. Yes. The answer to that is no, unless not not at this point per P100. We'll put it that way. They, they no. I, I will. I will add to that. They could. The courts could give us an RWA to provide a charging port in that area, but. That again, we, we would get reimbursed for that for the installation, and the judge or the user of that charger would pay for their electrical usage as a result of that as well. Yeah, so certainly our tenants can can pay us to do different things, but we're just trying to cover what the the base P one hundred requires at this point. So moving on, um, power sharing allows multiple charging ports to share a single branch circuit. We spoke about that a little bit earlier. That's uh, the most efficient way to charge, assuming that meets the need. Charge management capabilities must be included to limit the expansion of the power distribution system and limit the exposure to peak demand charges. Common elements to include under the charge management are delayed charging, staggered charging, and avoid avoiding time of day peak rates. So Jeff spoke about that a bit earlier, but again, if you can charge overnight um, and you can share that charger between multiple vehicles and have an ample charge for the next day to do your job, that's the way to go about it, as opposed to, say, plugging in at four o'clock in the afternoon on a hot summer day and, and charging at that point, because those would be high peak demands. Limited, uh, limited chargers may be added to the emergency generator uh, or EPSS where required by tenant policy and spare Sorry, capacity. Sorry, girl. I'm going to take it with me. That's why I'm 
Um, where spare EPSS capacity is not available, a standalone battery energy storage system could be considered and would be recommended. And that could be charged via utility power and off hours, PV, that sort of thing. There are certain circumstances where it makes sense to have these electric chargers, or electric uh, vehicles charged by a diesel generator, such as possibly an LPOE for an emergency vehicle, but um, it's not uh, prevalent, I'll say. So where no tenant, poli tenant policy exists, POV EVSC requirements uh, provide the following infrastructure. So when we say infrastructure here, we're talking about empty conduit. We want to install that empty conduit when the facility is being constructed, parking lots are being poured, parking buildings are being built, that sort of thing, so that we have that pathway there in the future, so that if, as we spoke about earlier, we um, are funded to provide chargers for POVs, that we can do that uh, in the least intrusive way, as opposed to drenching concrete or asphalt and that sort of thing. So if, they, if the tenant doesn't have a policy, then P100 says for lots fewer than 50 POVs, install infrastructure, to be conduits again, for two charging ports. For lots with 50 to 100, it would be six charging port, ports, and for greater than 100, 6% of the planned POV parking. Further on infrastructure, this is for GOVs and POVs, and I would say that these this is for like a future installation of GOVs, so they kind of merge together here. I want to go slowly through this to hopefully mitigate any confusion. So one power conduit between the nearest electric room or otherwise approved location to each charger and where the empty conduit is provided for future use. So that could be POV future use or it could be for GOV future use. The minimum conduit size is two and a half inches for runs up to 100 feet and three inches for longer runs. That is those conduits are much larger than what would be typically needed, but we don't know what we're going to run into in the future, how many chargers that may share that conduit, and we, we increase the size due to voltage drop and for those reasons. So we've had folks come to us and say, well, we know exactly what we're installing. Do we still have to install a two and a half inch conduit? And that's not the case. We've allowed them to install what they need because they know what they're installing at that point. I put in bold here, this is for future. So we make sure we're protected in the future. We have what we need in the ground. Likewise, for the communications conduit, a minimum of one inch communication conduit between an approved network switch location or otherwise approved location and each charger must be included for any installation that is not using cellular communications or when future communication method is unknown. Many of our cases, I would say over 90% are using cellular. And if, if that's the case and you know that, then you don't have to install this extra conduit. But if you don't know, or in some cases you don't have cellular, then you do need to install it. Um, and if you, you know, especially underground parking, things like that, there, there, is a, there is a place for it. So and, uh, further infrastructure, um, including both GOVs and, and POVs, power conduits at the charging station must terminate in a concrete traffic graded handhold enclosure. Communication must also terminate in a, in a traffic graded handhold enclosure. All conduits must be provided with pull string and be sealed with waterproof plugs. This is pretty standard for an underground conduit. Traffic rated handhold enclosures are not required in locations that are not exposed to vehicular traffic. And underground conduit installation requirements can be found in 654. That's back up in Chapter 6 and the site requirements. Uh, there's, there's additional requirements there for conduit installation underground. And do we have any questions before I turn it over to a bass? I think there's several. All right. So we're gonna we're gonna start in with some of these that came in here. So so Steve has a question. Apparently he knows of a judge that's plugging into Wallow. I, I say it isn't so, Steve. I, oh my goodness, yeah. We, we know that's happening out there. Uh, but it, it is not code compliant. Uh, it, it's that 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 outlet is not GFCI protected in most cases. If it's a maintenance outlet, it's not. Uh, it, it's there, there's it doesn't meet any C the electrical code requirements. There's, there's several things wrong with them doing that uh, beyond the fact it's kind of like, be, you know, obviously you want to be very tactful, but there's a little bit of theft involved there. You know, they, they are getting something for nothing. They're getting that electrical power for nothing. You know, the, the fast tax says we're supposed to get reimbursed for all, all, all these charging efforts. Uh, if, if they're using a, a wall outlet, uh, maybe you you trip that breaker, you know, don't let them use that anymore. You want to be, you want to kind of do it, uh, kind of, kind of be a little bit safe or something like that. Uh, they're not supposed to be doing that. 
again, as a judge, I, I, you have to be very highly, highly tactful. I, I feel I feel your pain. I'm glad it's not me that's a property manager having to deal with that. So Mark asked the question, do charge manage, management systems by GSA operations teams? If so, how does the operations team know how best to program the charge management systems? So I will say we're we're on the, the the we're just learning the charge management system what we need to do what we need to have included there but it's going to be unique per building uh, you know different levels of tenants some some tenants law enforcement may have may have higher level requirements than say a GSA vehicle or something like that uh, it's, it's gonna there's gonna be many different little tiers in there and and uh, GSA needs to be involved in, in that conversation as to how that controls need to be done for each vehicle uh, uh, for for each tenant. Uh, but they don't necessarily have to be the ones programming it. Uh, but that is something that we need to have included in our in our in our SOWs in in our scopes uh, to make sure that that's included. The, these meetings with GSA, the meetings with whatever, uh, and that these are tested out during the commissioning. And I think uh, Neil answered Devin's question, so I think we're good. Hey Jeff, that that on power management, I, I agree completely what you said. Um, it just it's going to require more conversation with tenants. If we're going to use their cars with their batteries to power with, you know, how we power, we use vehicle to grid and how we power the building or how do we, at what time, and it's going to be more into the, the realm of the vehicle to grid, vehicle to building, but also how we manage power with a dashboard. So we, we, we are not there yet, but we are getting into that. Yeah, and I, and I will guarantee you, you know, I don't care who the tenant is. They're going to say, when I plug my car in, I need to have it charging immediately. We may not have the ability to do that. We may, we again, we have limited capacity. Our, our, our building may not be able to support that. So that's where this control comes into play. It may not, it's not us trying to be mean. It's just what we physically have to deal with. And that's why we also have uh, DC fast charging available if the tenant wants to fast charge it. But again, it goes to the in infrastructure of the building. Exactly, yes, yeah. Okay. All right. I'd like to turn it over to Michael for accessible charging. Thank you, Ben. Appreciate that. Thanks everybody for being on the call to take a look at EV charging and also accessible EV charging and uh, how we try to apply the ABA and accessibility standards to our EV supply equipment on our in our facilities, our GSA facilities, and just to let you know that it, uh, I think it was last January where we uh, finally um, GSA worked on and agreed upon a policy statement that uh, is this policy statement has, has now been translated into to the. The P100 here, and I'll be going over some of those bullet points, um, you know, after this introduction. And um, again, Michael Fogel, a National Accessibility Officer out of the Central Office, worked very closely with the, all the regions on accessibility issues, and we have, uh, and also worked with the regional accessibility officers to answer questions or issues with respect to accessibility. So, if there are any questions about accessibility in a particular region, we certainly have a regional officer to work with that, or certainly talk to me about it. Anyway. These uh, uh, accessible charging stations are um, a direct reflection of the US Access, US Access Board's recommendations for accessible charging. Now, there are, um, just to let you know that our policy uh, does differ from some of the recommendations uh, of the US Access Board in terms of the quantity and location of, of our accessible, our, uh, our charging stations with mobility and retrange features. And they are, right now, the US Access Board is going through a rulemaking process on it to turn the recommendations into guidelines, which then will be re referred to us as standards for us to, for GSA to either adopt or to modify. Now, I know that earlier today uh, there was a discussion about, uh, and, I, and it doesn't say that on here, but I wanted to talk really quickly about the waiver process and um, where if you look at 1.2.4.1, there is a P100 waiver process, 
but also in that in that uh, description of waivers for any uh, waivers requested for the uh, out of the uh, ABAS Architectural Bears Act. That is a different waiver process, and that process can be found at, in the the um, National Accessibility Program Standards, Policies, and Procedures, which is linked there, and that goes through a different process than the P100 waiver. So understand that that will go through our, the the uh, a, a certain uh, different approval process, different information required, and also to go up to the commissioner of PBS for for its approval. So understand there's a P100 waiver, but because this has a, a lot more to do with accessibility even though there's a GSA, what I call it, overlay, the, any waivers requested out of, uh, that have to do with accessibility will go through this process alone. So just want to throw that out there. And then uh, also in my introduction, as, as you can see, uh, if there are any uh, and, and local standards, I know that California has its own uh, accessibility or, or um, EBSC accessibility standards, if they are more restrictive, then typically we would use the more restrictive standards. And, and of course, that is um, uh, that would be on a case by case basis where we where, where we would see if those if those standards would be more advantageous to GSA. And so we, I, we break this down into a couple of different aspects. What are the components of a of, uh, of an our, our, accessible charging station and then we break it down to site requirements and then there are a few exceptions and so as you can see the components of the uh, of our charging state spaces you know are uh, re are uh, defined here are 11 by 20 there um, and these are are basically uh, uh, per the you uh, the uh, US access board recommendations but then we have a hands-free charging, which are basically the site in the same size as our accessible charging or our, our accessible parking spaces. And the reason that we that those are different is that for the standard charging spaces, because the ports are in different locations on the on the on the car or the, or the vehicle, with, with respect to wherever the charger is, uh, that the the GS, or GSA and USAB recommend a larger space so that somebody who is in a wheelchair or, or with a disability can get around the vehicle easier. <laughs> and then with the hands-free, obviously, since there is no port, it's all uh, there, is, there is no pose that then you can go back to the original or to a typical size. And as you can see in that one photo, that one picture above the ex what the accessible charger and port there could look like and then the picture below how the um what the charger and the port would an accessible charger or a part a charger and port with accessible and mobility features would would look like and then there is a, a wide a litany of information about what is required at, at the charger all transactions are to be within reach ranges there's a, a communication interface for sight and hearing impaired. Uh, th there's a maximum force or lift of the cord. So the, a lot of times you would see a rack or a arm in these situations that would support the cord and, uh, as it would uh, uh, turn and go to, into the uh, uh, attached to the car. And uh, so the other element are the uh, site features, and these are and this is where we um, GSA has tried to provide as much flexibility as we can in order to support some of our very different types of parking facilities. I know that that there is a priority as to where the parking that that they, we would prefer to put the except the part of the charging spaces. The, Service lots, you know, parking structures, and then and then um, you know other elements, or maybe even underground. So because of some fire issues with um, electricity, fire, life safety, <clears throat> and so um, our we our three options are to, uh, our our to, our site one option is a very typical accessibility option, which you'll find in the um, in the U.S. Access Board, where if there is a particular parking facility and the parking facility is a 
a, a parking lot that supplies one one building alone. You can see in that picture there the, set, the different parking facilities that are supplying the different access or the different buildings. Now, if they if they're if one chooses to add a accessible or a parking or you know, even charging supply equipment in any par particular parking facility, they would also be required to provide an access uh, accessible parking facility. Now, the other part to what, what I wanted to talk about here is that when we look at our accessible charging, uh, accessible uh, charging station, it's not necessarily what we like to call a, um, a dedicated, where that it is just for somebody, uh, for a, a, a person uh, with a disability with a placard, that it is, just, it is only uh, only to charge a, a um, you know, it's only to charge a person with disabilities car or, or vehicle. We, we, we um, have expanded the, the, these spaces so that these spaces are uh, have mobility features and are identified to have mobility features and we request, we were, request last use but every anybody can use these um, um, uh, these accessible spaces or these accessible charging spaces and, and, and that's particular to uh, the site option one and then uh, what uh, an addition to that would be where we would uh, ask if you if if you look at the element, the, the photograph for below, where you see the accessible charging spaces on the left and the accessible route that goes into the building, which is required from all accessible, from, that's part of the mobility or accessibility features of the accessible charging space. We also would, we, we would recommend that instead of putting an accessible charging space out there to support that accessible, those charging stations that you could put one closer to the building or closest to the building so you don't have to have such a very long accessible route but you could put you could put an accept one with with um you know with uh, accessible mobility features closer to the building to cut down on the route and and make it easier for people with disabilities to find that that accessible space and to use it and sometimes in conjunction with the accessible parking now the uh, um Side option three, which is something that we discussed about how we could try to integrate the existing accessible parking spaces into uh, and, and 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 charging spaces into our designs, because I, I mean, when we look at these these uh, drawings, it shows all this wonderful parking we have on our sites and. All this, uh, all this space that we have, and I know that a lot of GSA sites or facilities, we certainly don't have the luxury of all this type of parking. And so I know our parking, especially our accessible parking, is at, is at a premium. And so we do our best to try to integrate, and that's what the, uh, the option three is about. And the option three is that if we can, we can certainly try to use an existing stall but the caveat, and this is where um, you know, this is more like future proofing or future looking, is that that option, since we're keeping the same width of the stall, is where we would uh, we would ask for we require a hands-free charging of a, of a system there. And I know in the United States right now we're not really uh, a lot of hands-free charging is not typical, in, you know, in terms of our stall and installation. But uh, we wanted to put this option so we could try to work work towards work forward to that where we have certain installations that are, are very prohibitive when it comes to the site and the, the amount of parking that we have in the, uh, you know, the available to us. And so I'm going to move on to uh, uh, the, uh, the next slide, and this is the this is the exciting one. This is where we talk about the exceptions and uh, the typically with the exceptions we are tr trying to align as best we can with the U.S. Access Board and how they look at exceptions for accept uh, ex uh, uh, accessible parking. And so as you can see there under the um, and we're only talking about GOV now. I mean, this is all federal federal 
fleet, federal, uh, federal uh, um, uh, facilities. And so, as you can see, GOV, POV, there was really no exceptions for, for POV. And on GOV uh, facilities, we do not have law for, uh, any other emergency or law enforcement vehicles parking there except for government government owned vehicles. So understand that this is uh, the exceptions are for, for GOV uh, and P, uh, POV 10 initiated alternatives, not for uh, the basic uh, POV parking. And so, as you can see, the our, one of the uh, exceptions is for uh, basically service vehicles, trucks, buses, delivery vehicles, and the general exception is re referenced in ABAS F two eight point one, and uh, and it located at a particular parking facility. And so that when I say that is that when they are grouped in a particular parking facility, that park and you're going to add access or add charging spaces to that parking facility then no, you are not required to provide an accessible uh, uh, parking or accessible uh, supply equipment. But if you are, if you have one parking facility, aka a parking lot, and you are blending the different elements, you have uh, GOV parking or fleet parking here next to these emergency vehicles, then you would certainly need to provide the accessible, accessible charging space for that, for that GOV fleet, for the federal fleet. And then uh, the the second one, and this one is our, a, a, an ad from the original do documentation. I'm hoping to get this in our addendum if we are going to provide one for P100. Is the uh, the the exemption for spaces reserved for, for specific federal employees? And and I know some uh, somebody asked earlier about the judges' parking spaces. And the judge's parking spaces would be a good example of a specific federal employee, which if it's uh, signage for this one particular person and this one particular person it wants to, you know, it wants to have a, an accessible charging station or space there, then um, we are uh, GSA, even though it's just it's one, and we ask that if, if you're putting in one, it's be accessible because it's speci specifically assigned, then we would not require that space to be uh, to have mobility or retrain features or be accessible. So that's important to note. And um, obviously, we would certainly don't want the judges plugging, plugging their, uh, their vehicle into an outlet, but at the same time, we uh, uh, one of our exceptions is that unless they request an accessible accessibility features, it's not required um, in terms of uh, supplying some uh, uh, charging equipment to that space. And so, it, and so very quickly, uh, 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 that's my uh, presentation. And um, I know there's a lot, uh, a lot of moving parts with this. And if there's any particular or specific questions that and it would have, I'm looking at the chat here, um, that, uh, <clears throat> um, I'm not sure what the conflict is because they, uh, uh, th those are th two or three different ways to look at the uh, uh, accessible parking. And uh, um, remember reserved is for uh, dedicated vehicles for persons with disability and reserve and not the unreserved is for not uh, for people with not without the disability or for everybody and so that's where we look at the parking spaces particular parking spaces and, and that we have uh, uh, for accessibility Okay. I'm going to turn it over to David. So, yeah. David, go ahead. Okay. Thanks, Michael. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. My name is Dave Frabel. I work in the Office of Facilities Management, Risk Management Division, and I manage the fire protection program. Uh, during this presentation, I'm going to provide you with a brief overview of the fire protection requirements that are required when EV charging stations are installed within a parking structure or an outdoor parking area. Uh, the intent of all these requirements is to establish a reasonable level of safety for building occupants, the federal property, and emergency, emergency first responders. Uh, that is basically uh, the fire department personnel. 
from potential hazards should an EV fire occur. So the first subject is discussing parking structures and fire protection. An automatic fire sprinkler system and a standby system must be installed throughout a parking structure when EV charging stations are installed. This includes both open parking structures and enclosed parking structures. I also recommend uh, that you refer to Chapter 7, uh, Section 7.11.12, Parking Structures, for some additional requirements for both sprinkler systems and standpipe systems. Next, let's discuss outdoor parking areas. For outdoor parking areas, the horizontal separation distance from an exterior wall of a building or any other potential exposure hazard must be taken in consideration. There's four options listed in P100 that need to be discussed with the regional fire protection engineer to select the correct option depending on the location site-specific conditions. Option one is the separation distance at least 20 feet, 25 feet or more. Option two is the separation distance at least 30 feet or more if the exterior wall of the building is constructed of combustible materials or contains unprotected openings. Option three is the separation distance acceptable to the regional fire protection engineer if it incorporates an alternative approach to achieve the necessary safety. Or option four, the separation distance is at a distance acceptable to the regional fire protection engineer with respect to any fire exposures to any other potential hazards. Those are the four options uh, that you need to go over with your regional fire protection engineer. Now let's discuss the requirements associated with the installation of manual power supply disconnecting means, which disconnects the power supply to the EV charging station. A manual power supply disconnecting means must be installed for all level two and level three electric vehicle charging stations. These manual power disconnecting means must be in a location for use by fire department personnel or other emergency responding individuals. I would strongly suggest you discuss the possible locations with the regional fire protection engineer and the local fire department or fire code official prior to installing these devices. Signings, signage is required at the EV's charging station to inform the responding fire department personnel and others where the manual power disconnecting means is located. And also signage is required at the disconnecting means to inform the responding fire department personnel and others which EV charging station will be dis disconnected from the power supply. And lastly, uh, signage must be installed at each entrance to the parking structure, indicating the presence and the locations of any EV charging stations. Signage must be visible from a vehicle entering the parking structure and must indicate that EV charging stations are present and which parking levels the EV charging stations are located. And that basically is my brief overview of the fire protection requirements in P100. Uh, ben, Jeff, Mike, I guess we'll now open it up to any other questions. Thanks, David. Dave, uh, we do have one question uh, from David Lee. How does the fire sprinkler requirements apply to enclosed parking spaces that only house POVs that do not have EV charging now? 
but with the new P100, it allows for future charging. The requirements in P100 for new parking structures, uh, the sprinkler requirements would apply to all, both open and enclosed parking structures. So the new for new parking structures being built, they will be sprinkler to the current requirements in the code. Did I answer the question? I think so, David. Feel free to come off mute if it's not clear. Okay. Any other questions out there? Oh, see one just came in. What about shunt trip? We do not have a requirement for shunt trip with activation of the sprinkler system. Is there a concern? We got manual power disconnecting means installed within the facility. He, yeah, I was asked by local fire and life safety to include a verbiage in my scope of work regarding a shunt trip to the sprinkler system. I've gotten a little bit of pushback from the contractor saying that they didn't have to do it out in California. And I said, well, I've been asked to do it by my fire safety group. So I'm in region 11. Is that um, still required or not? And I see Laura raised her hand, so. Right, that's no longer required. Correct. That was a draft a long time ago, one of the initial drafts requirements, but that was removed based on past discussions and different draft requirements in the interim guidance. Okay, because I haven't seen any anywhere that said it was removed so hey, hey ron how old is that scope of work you're talking about it was the the response was sent back um i'm going to say a couple of months ago but hold on the 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 scope of work was developed when our draft dave was developed and that's where the requirement came from probably back in 20 early 23 22 late 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 23 late 23 now the new guidance what came out in september 2023 p100 came out in may 2024 okay so i can tell them that they do no longer need to do the shunt trip that's, that's right okay yep yes any other okay. questions um i'd like to go back up and, and visit the question from mark um on accessibility he says p100 seems to conflict and acs is not reserved to vehicles for people with disabilities unless the acs is replacing an existing accessible parking space and then number two it says signage to denote reserved dedicated to vehicles for persons with disabilities acs to comply with signage consistent with so I, I don't know that I have enough there, Mark. Um, if you want to come off mute, um, but it, it does that does seem to be a bit conflicting. What I guess the part I'm getting hung up on is unless the ACS is being replaced or re replacing an existing accessible accessible parking space. Yeah, I, I guess uh, my question is, you know, the first statement in P100 says the ACA spaces are not reserved, but then the second statement says. There should be a sign saying they are reserved. So um, it seems confusing to me. So are there some ACA charging stations that need to be reserved for people with disabilities and others that are not? And how how is that known? Well, um, and the three options for putting in an accessible ACS. One um, in the options where you're at, you are adding it or putting it in with a typical uh, charging station, you know, like with five or six charging spaces or two charging spaces. 
the accessible one that goes in with the particular charging station, that one will have mobility features, but it would not be reserved for a person with a disability only. And, and so if you look at the other options, the, the option where we, there is an option where we do replace one of the accessible parking stalls with an with an access uh, a, an accessible charging station or charging space and then that stall itself would would be um, would be designated reserved and signaged accordingly okay so that one particular accessible charging space that's replacing the charging the, the accessible parking that that one has to be hands-free and it would uh, you would still have to have uh, you know have all the reach ranges for the and all the other accessible features have to go be there but it would also be reserved and so it would, it would be assigned at, it would be signage that reserved for a person with a disability so a couple of like I said, a couple of options. If you if you want to if you want to add a a, cha a charging station, and then you want to add an accessible charging space to that charging station that's in a parking lot someplace, that charging that accessible charging station would be have mobility features and accessible route to the entrance, but it would not be reserved. It would not be signage. Yeah, thank you, Ben. That answers my question. Yeah. Okay, great. Uh, there was a hand, Richard. Question? Yeah, question. Are you basing these uh, charging stations off the size of the garage or the parking lot or the building? Um, how many you get per per uh, uh, parking space or building garage? How, how many a lot of per square foot or whatever? So the quantity uh, of quantity of vehicles. Oh, uh, just the quantity of vehicles only. Yeah. Okay. So any last questions out there? Oops. Question about so basically you can't reduce number of ADA spaces. No, no, no. <laughs> Certainly not. And eight and again, we uh, because we're the federal government and we rely on federal funding for our facilities. We are uh, we use the ABA and not the ADA as our uh, uh, as our uh, um, compliant code, our code, code compliance. And there are very fundamental differences between the ADA and the ABA that have to do with scoping and accessibility in terms of the uh, the, the workforce as opposed to the uh, public facing. And so, please, um, we uh, we work with inside the uh, Architectural Barriers Act and their codes and guidelines. So, yes, and and one of the big got codes that they talk about. I mean, that's one of the you know, first things they say in scoping is that you cannot reduce accessibility. And so, when we, I mean, and I know this, and the, and this is something that we kind of talked a lot about. Is that if you go in and you go ahead and uh, convert one of the accessible parking stalls into a a, a, uh, a charging space that ha uh, that has mobility features, well, that is still ex an accessible parking stall. It just has it has it has it's it's it, it has a dual role as an accessible charging space now still and, and with all the accessible and mobility features that are required for an accessible charging space but again it, 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 it we we are we asked it to be hands free right so that we don't have to expand the, the parking space we can leave the parking space the same size because if we, the the typical accessible parking spaces or charging spaces are bigger, wider, and deeper than a typical accessible um, um, uh, parking space. Uh, Michael, um, I'm a disabled vet, and uh, I would like to have uh, accessibility to parking. So, are you saying? that the ABA supersedes the ADA and in this situation when it comes to parking, or are you guys working 
uh, together, whatever in this process or whatever. Who? Well, ABA, well, for a lot of the technical content, ABA and ADA are you know synonymous. They're about they're the same, but uh, um, but the federal government uses the ABA as its as its code uh, as as a statute. So the A if there uh, and with this accessible, you know, this is a GSA overlay with this accessible. You know, uh, EV uh, electric vehicle supply equipment. We are trying to be flexible and 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 trying to uh, be um, sensitive to where we place these accessible charging spaces. We're trying to get them nearer the accessible uh, uh, parking spaces, or we're trying to get them so that um, they can be um, you know they can be easily found. Or and at the same time that they are they can be used uh, as a last use in the charging stations themselves. So when I say ABA and ADA, like uh, uh, when it comes to a lot of the scoping uh, or the uh, technical requirements, they're about the same. But neither of them have this this type of information with respect to accessible charging. Um, you know, the, 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 the scoping of, of accessible charging spaces that right now they're all in the recommendation phase. And so that's why we're, we're here to try to make sense of it with GSA and try to place these ch accessible charging spaces in places where, where you can find them, right? And, and also we're, we're out there on accessible routes into the building and they meet all the requirements, you know, for, for retranges and, and clear floor areas and that kind of a thing. So I'll always assume that we're, we're trying to make it more accessible and that the ADA is not any less accessible than the ABA, but that it's just because we're the federal government, we follow the ABA, you know. And the, but like I said, one of the bigger differences between ADA and ABA, ADA, they're more uh, public facing and commercial building facing. ABA kind of uh, uh, public facing, but they also accessibility reaches into the federal workforce and their and their facility spaces. So when it comes to parking, the number of parking spaces, the number of accessible parking spaces, that kind of a thing, ABA and the ADA are are, are the same. But uh, it's good that uh, all the federal employees know that we work with the ABA. So that that's my long answer to that question. So is, did I answer that, Richard? To, to fight, to fight? I, I guess you did. <laughs> Thanks okay, for the thank knowledge. You. I hope I did. <laughs> um, uh, Priya has a hand up. This is something for me. Yeah. Well, um, this is sort of a nagging question that I have as relates to POV vehicles and electric charging, um, as pertains to the discussion about peak. Um, I think you said like peak charging rates um, and how to actually quantify like a, the cost that um, uh, an employee is using if it's for POV use. And the reason this kind of comes into play is in my recollection, I only know of one building where there are POV um, electric vehicle charging stations um, and they are charged a flat cost annually for the use of that space. Um, but I imagine that somewhere in there, or maybe to come, we should understand what the true cost is of their charging, um, partially because it kind of comes up against that threshold of um, how much the value of a parking space uh, can be given um, as a, what is it called? A It's like a supplemental, it's for tax purposes. Like you can't have more than about, I think like a $400 um, a cost of a parking space monthly that's sort of gifted to you from the government. So that's my whole, I, I hope that that sort of makes sense. Um, it, I guess I'm asking specifically about um, if there's a way to look up or to understand more about the pricing um, and then how that might be configured in the future. And if that's something that would go into like the pricing desk guide in the future, or if that would be something that would first need to be um, stipulated in like p100 guidance um i i don't know if i can answer that question um, i'm, I'm going to jump in here real, yeah i'm, I'm going to jump in here real fast, I, I think I, I know the pricing policy for gsa has been updated uh, as far as trying to capture that that peak demand that utility chart that's a moving target month to month so i don't know how you would i'd be able to capture that 
Uh, maybe you could look back at the end of a year and be able to cycle that into to reassess for next year what those next rates are going to be or something like that. But it, it, like I said, it is a moving target. It changes monthly. Uh, Joseph has a raised hand. Yep. Yeah, I just wanted to say, hey, uh, Dave Frabel and Ron Collins, I, I looked at the review comments regarding uh, Ron's question, and he made jest of uh, have a misunderstand misunderstanding, or the contractor may have a misunderstanding of manual disconnecting means versus the shunt trip. We did not say sun trip in that. We just, uh, according to our policy, use the um, manual disconnecting uh, wordage in the uh, review comments back there in January 2024. Okay. Thank you, Joe. Yeah, thanks for clarifying. Any last comments? Thank you all for all the great questions and your attentiveness. And I'm. Thanks, everybody. I appreciate your. Uh...